Well, I want to thank you, David. I want to thank Guru, and I want to thank uh, Sean Gildsdorf and Cecily Pollard and all of you for coming out. I know it's freezing out there. This is the real cold snap that tells us that winter is on its way. Um, and I'm really happy to talk about this book. You know, once you write a book, you kind of, it's over, right? It's, I've just taught the three author essays that you probably know, the Foucault, Derrida, Barth essays about the death of the author. And I feel like having written the book, I now have no longer spent company with this really um, singular woman. And so it's really nice to return to it and talk about it with you today. Uh, she is a singular woman. I think she should be counted as the first of Mamluks to rule Egypt. Not typically acknowledged as such, but I think that's what she is. And so she was the progenitor in that sense of a succession of rulers that lasted more than 250 years. Progenitor is an odd word to apply to a Mamluk ruler, as you know, since succession was not handed from father to son, but was based or obtained on merit. And as it happened, some fathers did manage to establish a real kind of hereditary succession for a few generations. We can think of Sultan Kalawun. But overall, rulers were chosen to rule by the elite or they simply grabbed power because they were strong enough to do so. Either one is a demonstration of merit. The guiding principle was not inheritance, but ability. And this is actually very important because it helps explain how she comes to be Sultan. It is, however, somewhat paradoxical then that it would be a woman who launched the, the I want to say Mughal, the Mamluk Sultanate, since women appear in the historical chronicles mostly in their capacity as mothers. Their ability measured in the success of their sons, not their own acumen or political capital. I want to clarify also that this is a story about a woman, and her tomb is seen here again. And while we often shift fluidly from the term woman to gender, the story that I'm going to tell does not interrogate gender in the way that Afsane Najmabadi or Judith Butler urge us to do. I want to be really clear that I'm not engaging in that kind of theorization. Butler calls for us to reject what she calls regimes of truth that establish and regulate gender normativity. Well, there is some uh, regulating, or I could call it, um, um, what's the word, rejecting of gender normativity that happens. And while Najmabadi identifies the binary of male and female as a regulatory framework, produced in the West and exported to other places where it then served to mask other forms of gender. So we have these two kind of ideas about gender, and to some extent they do enlighten uh, my project, but that's not what the project is about. Their arguments are nuanced in ways that I can't capture in a brief summary, but to understand some of what they're saying, we can recognize the clear presence of a third gender in the Ayyubid and Mamluk courts, and that would be the eunuch. And I would say there's actually multiple genders, but that's a very clear one. So anyway, I want to clarify that in studying this singular woman, Shajaradur, Tree of Pearls, I'm not exploring gender per se as a category for analysis, but looking at one life that was lived within a highly gendered set of constrictions and that ultimately broke those constrictions with consequences. And the story is about Shajaradur and the Mamluks. It is also about Cairo. Cairo in the 13th century experienced significant changes to its social and spatial structures, becoming a decidedly cosmopolitan city. Its population changed due to the forced uh, immigration of male and female slaves, and these newcomers were largely Turkic. We know that they introduced Turkic as a new language, spoken at the very highest level of the court. With them came new social customs, one of which seems to have been greater leeway for the agency of women. And I have to say, I read this everywhere, I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence to actually demonstrate that. So I think this is a hypothesis at this point until we can really do some research on where um, or why and when and how behavioral norms for women change. In addition, in addition to innovation coming from the Northeastern steppe, new ideas also arrived from Western Europe via the Crusaders. The repertoire of arts changed as a result of nearly constant conflict and exchange with the Crusaders. Uh, and it's important to remember that some of the Crusades were fought on Egyptian soil. Uh, the Delta region actually was the site of um, a Crusader attack. 
And when we think about exchange, we can look at the Acre portal, which was spolia from a crusader church that was then added to a madrasa mausoleum complex right opposite the one that I'm going to tell you about. Or we could look at a mosque lamp with these very characteristic glass blazons that are clearly connected to Christian heraldry. These are all very evident signs of cultural exchange, and I just bring them here because they're probably already familiar to you, so you'll know what I'm talking about. These items belong to the Mamluk period, so a little later than the period I'm talking about, but they are indicative of the kind of exchange that was already occurring under the Ayyubids. The city's public space was gradually transitioning from one organizational paradigm, a series of structures placed somewhat opportunistically along narrow streets, to a different one. And in that new model, the street was acquiring value as a place in its own right, with handsome facades, relatively generous width of the street, at least wide enough for pedestrians to be able to step back and see the facade. And I'm showing you here Nicholas Warner, he, he, the most beautiful set of maps I've ever seen, um, that shows the city, this is particularly the area um, that I'm going to be talking about right here. Uh, he shows it, you know, with all the Mamluk buildings in there, so you have to kind of think them away. But even if we think away the Mamluk buildings, you can already see that there is this artery that is running through, and of course it's going from the north to the south of the Fatimid city, and it's along here that we have the beginning of these kinds of facades, and the facade that I'm going to be talking about is right here, there are these later buildings that were put in there. We have to imagine them away and imagine that you almost had not quite a plaza, but certainly something like a boulevard that is developing here. And this is a different kind of street. The buildings were not simply plunked in the city. They were placed on the main avenue, the Bain al Kasrain. And the city was not simply the place, the space, excuse me, the street was not simply the space left over between buildings but a designed place with character in its own right. So it's not just the building that's a thing, it's now that kind of formally what we called an empty space that has now become also a thing. These were changes that had begun under the Fatimid rulers, of course, this isn't something that was invented by the Ayyubids. The Fatimids were a Shi'i dynasty who ruled until 1169 or so. And while one might expect that Sunni Ayyubid rulers who succeeded them might reject Fatimid innovations, that does not seem to have been the case. The Ayyubids took over the Fatimid city, preserving its walls, gates, and mosques. And I'm showing you here uh, just a map of the city, and here's that main avenue running through it. Uh, they, they preserved sort of the religious buildings and the civic buildings, but not the Fatimid palace, two palaces actually, which had been located right here in the center. That charged location in the very heart of the walled city was the site, you know, once the buildings had been demolished, chosen by the Ayyubid Sultan Salih, who we're going to talk more about, for his madrasa. So this is a very conscious selection of site. This was not only a statement about political replacement, the wiping away of the Fatimid palaces, but also a strategic emplacement, meaning the spaces of the city matter. They have pre, we could call it almost a pre-charged meaning. However, if the Fatimids had begun to develop the city, under the Ayyubids, Cairo began to take on new character as an expressive, uh, expressive form. And we see this very clearly in the introduction of the madrasa as a new civic institution and a new building type. Cairo had lots of them built in the Ayyubid period, only this one survives. There's actually a, p a little piece of another one, but nothing much to see. And even this one doesn't really uh, survive all that well. It's the facade that survives, the minaret, the tomb, which we're going to talk about. But if you go in there, it's become kind of a what do I call it, a kind of a worker's workshop area. The, the iwans of the, of the madrasa are actually not even there anymore. So the madrasa al-Salihiya is hard to see. And um, this, is a, this is a picture taken by Caroline Williams. If you know Caroline Williams, you know that she has pictures of everything in Cairo. Uh, and she generously shared it with me. 
Um, but what I want to show you is here are those modern buildings that have been stuck in there. You have to imagine them away and imagine this facade here as something that you would see. Also, imagine away this later fountain that was not there in the uh, late Ayyubid, early Mamluk period. So it's hard to see, and because of that, we usually look at it um, through this lovely drawing that was published by Creswell, because you can kind of step back and see it in the way it's meant to be seen. But even more important than this building, the madrasa, I think, was the monumental dynastic tomb of the patron, Sultan Salih, that was attached to the complex by the patron's wife, by then his widow, Shajar Adur, in the year 1250. Inside the city walls, which was unusual, and attached to the madrasa, also the tomb gave the madrasa, gave the whole complex, a new ability to express identity. Instead of inscriptions extolling the builder or the patron's overload, as seen in Fatimid mosques, and here you can see the um, inscription, the foundation inscription up here is much larger than the Quranic inscription inscriptions. But what's interesting here is it doesn't actually name the patron. It names the patron's patron. So even this doesn't really give the full identity of the building. But by the time we get to the Salihiyah Madrasa, it was the presence of that person's mortal remains, the mortal remains of the Sultan himself, that forged the link between identity and architectural patronage. And also inscriptions. I mean, there were also inscriptions here, but they're not particularly monumental. It is the body, the presence of the body, I claim, that brings that assertion of identity into the architectural work. Now, we can't attribute all of these architectural and urbanistic changes to Shajar Adur, although I would like to. But she did play a pivotal, a pivotal role in the political shift that happened in Cairo in the 13th century namely the change from Ayyubid to Mamluk rule. And we can ask whether it was Shajar Adur who introduced this new way of proclaiming identity through architecture in the tomb that she built for her husband, Sultan Salih, or whether it arose as a consequence of the new dynastic system. So one is a kind of personal attribution, the other is more of a generic attribution. And remember, the new system, the new Mamluk system, was based on individual merit because these were slaves that did not um, bequeath the sultanate to their sons. You had to earn it, as I explained at the beginning. And you had to claim it. But even if we conclude that it was this generic explanation that because she's a Mamluk and the Mamluks have to work so hard to claim anything, um, but even if we conclude the latter, that it was the new dynastic system that led to the insistence on personal identity in architecture, as the first of the Mamluks to rule, Shajar Adur still gets credit for being the first, meaning whatever way we slice it, she is at that pivotal moment uh, when these things start to change. So the question I want to pursue in the remainder of this talk is whether urbanistic change occurred because of her own agency as a person, in other words, because of who she was, someone with subjectivity and personal agency, or whether it was because of what she was, a mamluk. And I want to ask whether her female gender, the female body, had anything to do with it. Shajar Adur does not appear in the historical sources until she became the slave consort of Sultan Salih. To understand her story, we have to understand the way that slavery worked in that time and place. Sultan Salih ruled during a turbulent period when the Ayyubid political consortium threatened to fall apart. The Crusaders had to be repelled, and Cairo itself kept under control. They were constantly rebelling. His strategy was to establish, was to assemble a large army of slave soldiers, or Mamluks. The Mamluks were children sold or stolen into slavery from destitute families on the Mongol frontier. Huge numbers were trained for military service, and we know a lot about those slave soldiers because they became a very important social and political force. They became the Mamluk rulers. They also just became the elite. They were well-trained in horsemanship and archery, as we see from a manuscript here that shows um, Mamluk horsemanship. Uh, and they were taught Arabic and Quran studies. And upon completion of their education, by which point they had converted to Islam, they were manumitted, they were freed. And from there, many rose to high military and government positions. 
However, manumission did not mean disengagement because a slave in Islam, as you already know, I'm sure, even when freed, did not separate from the former master, but became a client or maula with a lifetime of continuing obligations between patron and former slave. And this was precisely the relation between Sultan Salih and his core of elite slave soldiers. There is a huge amount written about the Mamluks as soldiers, courtiers, governors, and sultans. But what historians rarely mention in their copious writing on the Mamluk phenomenon is that female children were bought at numbers equal to or double that of the boys. This is a classic case of omission simply because the historians were not interested in the question of the girls. They don't show up in the public life in quite the same way as the boys do. By the way, this uh, figure about um, equal or double comes from David Eilon, and I regard him as a very trustworthy historian. Um, he's the one statistic. What we're looking at here, well, I'll get to this in a minute. Although little has been written about the female of Mangluks, we know that they worked as maids, nurses, meaning wet nurses for babies, and laundresses, and they became the wives of the Mamluk soldiers, a case of slaves buying slaves. And they also, of course, served as concubines for whoever wished to purchase them. They were, after all, a form of property. And this is Shajar Adur's story, sold into slavery as a child and acquired at some point, presumably at a fairly young age, by Sultan Salih as his concubine. And so the reason why I'm showing you the Makamat, I'm sure you recognize it as the Makamat, that wonderful um, uh, illustrated manuscript that shows kind of daily life, is that it shows a scene, and, and these are sort of picturesque stories, right? They're supposed to be comical. This is not a particularly comical scene. It's a scene of a slave market. And the expression on the faces of those who are about to be sold is not one of comedy or fun. Uh, they clearly look concerned. This is the girl right here who is the subject of this particular story. There is her master wearing the red robe. I should use this right here. And he has come to sell her because he needs the money. And here up above, we have the sort of symbol of a life held in balance. What is she worth? What is her monetary worth? In fact, that's really going to happen to everyone down here. They're all going to be uh, assessed in terms of their monetary value. Now, why am I showing you this? This is a kind of generic girl Mamluk who's being sold into slavery. But what's interesting is that 1237 is just about the time when Shajar Adur would have been 12, 13, 14 years old. I mean, we don't know when she was born, but you know, we kind of know that when she became a concubine, she wasn't my age, right? She was young and nubile and was capable of having babies because she has one. So 1237 is about her age. And this is a picture, I forget whether it's Yemen or Syria. I think it's Yemen, um, which is also part of the Ayyubid realm. So this could be an illustration of her life, and I'm using it conveniently for that. And this is something we have to do when we study women. Because we don't have biographies of each of these Mamluk women, we have to resort to these kinds of kind of generic understandings of what a woman's life was like, not what any individual woman's life was like. Okay, moving on. During a tense period in which Sultan Salih was held captive by a rival Ayyubid claimant to the throne, Shajar Adur showed loyalty to him, and she earned his trust. And when she gave birth to their son, he married her. Although her son, Khalil, died after only a few months, the mere fact of his brief existence was enough to endow her with legal rights and political stature for the rest of her life as the mother of Khalil. And we see that in this coin uh, where we actually see, you know, Walidat Khalil, uh, Prince Khalil, right? Well, it's underlined for you so you can see it. Uh, and that's her title. That's how she's known, the mother of Khalil. One of the close observers of the court reported that the Sultan deeply loved Shajar Adur, which on the surface sounds touching. But let's remember that as a slave, she would not have been free to choose or reject him. The Sultan clearly relied on her because while he was away on military campaigns, he gave her authority in government matters. 
Therefore, when she, he died on the battlefield in 1249, he was fighting the Crusaders. He wasn't actually fighting them in the moment. He seems to have died of gangrene that was a side effect of tuberculosis, but he was at the battlefield. When he died, somewhat unexpectedly, Shajradur was well prepared to serve as regent. She concealed his death. This is not uncommon, it turns out. I found actually multiple cases of the death of the sultan being concealed until the heir can be obtained, because it's that vulnerable period. So she concealed his death until the heir, the sultan's son by a previous wife, could be recalled from his provincial post, and that took several months. During that unstable time of vulnerability and anxiety, Shajadadur governed as previously, as regent in the name of the sultan, whose death was kept secret, and as the mother of the long-deceased infant prince Khalil. She was helped considerably by the former sultan's advisors, many of whom were freed Mamluks. And remember, she is also a Mamluk, so I imagine there was some sort of kindred spirit there. I have to kind of read that into it. I mean, they might have spoken the same language even. When the Ayyubid heir finally arrived in Cairo, he behaved atrociously, abusing the Mamluks who had served his father faithfully. In one notorious instance, he drunkenly slashed the tips of a bunch of candles, crying that he would do the same to his father's Mamluks. The last straw was when he tried to seize Shajradur's jewels, which would have been, of course, her whole, you know, everything she had, right, would have been in property of jewels. The Mamluks were reportedly indignant on her behalf and resolved to assassinate the new sultan, which they did in April of 1250. And then something totally unexpected happened. In crisis, without sultan or heir, the Mamluks placed Shajradur herself on the throne. I make it sound like there were no possible alternatives, no other. That in the crisis caused by the recent assassination, she was the only viable choice and was elevated to sultan simply because there were no other options. But that's not true. Anyone who has studied the Ayyubids knows that there were dozens of princes vying to take possession of critical city-states and there were several who could have been enlisted to take charge of Cairo. Also, we should remember that Shajradur was not from the Ayyubid line, so once the Mamluks had decided to select a non-Ayyubid to lead, they had opened a box and they could conceivably have chosen any of the available Mamluks to lead. So let me, con let me correct my earlier statement. In crisis, the sultan having died unexpectedly, the Mamluks turned to someone knowledgeable and experienced in statecraft and strategy, a Mamluk like themselves, a capable person whom they trusted. Now, instead of acting as regent, Shajradur ruled as sultan in her own right. She was officially named such in the khutbah. I'm just showing you an example of a khutbah just because everyone likes the makamat. Um, so this is not obviously the khutbah, but I am showing you the actual text that is recorded of what was recited. Uh, and it gives, um, if we, we don't have to read through it, but if you look at it, it's, um, the, she's the slave, she's queen, she's uh, mother, slave, wife. You get the sense of this woman who's sort of cycling through these various, I don't want to call them identities, but certainly roles. However, appointing Shajradur as sultan, and we know she's sultan because her name is you know, pronounced in the khutbah, appointing her as sultan was problematic because she was a woman. and She couldn't ride in street processions and show herself in public as the head of state. She couldn't hold public audiences and entertain diplomats. She could not lead the army, the army being very important because the crusaders are still there uh, in the Mediterranean and on the shores of Egypt. Female sovereignty was widely regarded as inherently weak. In fact, ridiculous. It was regarded as ridiculous. Making Egypt vulnerable, not only to outside attack from the Crusaders, but also an invasion by an ambitious Ayyubid prince in Syria. The historian Makrizi reported that the caliph in Baghdad sent a stinging letter in which he said, if you lack men, let us know and we can send you one. 
The letter was almost certainly a fabrication. McCreasy's writing, you know, many years after the events in question. But I think it's important because it expresses a sentiment that is very true. Contemporary observers did report that even the very Mamluks who had appointed Shajir Adur were worried about the wisdom of putting a woman on the throne. And in Damascus, which had been part of Sultan Salik's portfolio until his untimely demise at the battlefield, the governor flatly refused to accept Shajir Adur as sultan. Nasr Yusuf, whom they chose as sultan instead of her, which is in Damascus, was in fact recorded as saying, it is not permitted for a former slave to rule over people and be named in Friday prayers. So whether because she was a woman or because she was a Mamluk, she was deemed unfit to be sultan. And so after ruling for three months, she was persuaded to cede the throne to an army commander named Aybak. To consolidate power, she then married him. Shajar Adur was no longer the sultan at this point, and yet all the sources, including some contemporary observers who were eyewitnesses to what was going on, they state that she remained the actual force behind the throne. One stated that she was still addressed as sultan. And another reported, and I quote, all the real power lay with Shajar Adur. Aybak could not do anything without her command. And that was, again, from a contemporary eyewitness. And so things stood. Shajar Adur continued to exert political power, but now in a less public manner, while Aybek led the army and was officially recognized as the head of state. That is the political scenario as related by the historians. But here is where architecture and urban space convey slightly different stories. When Sultan Salih was alive, he had had to win and control Cairo. And one of the Ayyubid strategies for maintaining a grip on the people had been to build state institutions like madrasas, as I mentioned earlier. Hence, in Cairo, in 1243, he had built his own madrasa, I've already referred to this, an endowed institution known as the Madrasa of Salihiyah. The Salihiyah had a tall, handsome minaret and a dignified exterior facade, and its ornament was seen from the public space of the street, another indication of new attention paid to public space. The street facade was not invented at this moment. Remember the Mosque of Akmar, I've already shown you, and the great gates at the north and south entrances to the walled city. These were all designed to attract the eyes of pedestrians and to give character to the city. But the way that architectural display could be used to insist upon individual identity emerges now in a new, more powerful way, perhaps because the Salihiyah was not a mosque, but a civic institution, a madrasa, and therefore, I argue, more capable of absorbing uh, the patron's identity. Equally important as the madrasa in this regard was the tomb. And you see that on the left here, the tomb that the sultan's widow, Shajar Adur, added to it shortly after the sultan's death. Square in plan, a tall dome, it actually doubles the height of the rest of the building. Like the madrasa, it has a skewed facade that respects the pre-existing street. You all know what a skewed facade is, but just in case there's an undergraduate in the room, when the building has this orientation and the street, which runs this way, does not conform to the same orientation, the building will actually extend itself outward to the street. This is a wonderful example of the building honoring the street and saying, I will meet you where you are, instead of asking you to kind of form this haphazard leftover space after the facade has been built. Uh, I find this actually very important uh, to the argument of, of street building. So what's interesting here also is if the madrasa has this uh, skewed facade, so does the tomb, which doesn't really need it. But what's interesting here is the way the tomb juts out into the street, making an aggressive claim on public space and asserting its presence even more forcibly than the rest of the building. And of course, by its presence, I mean the sultan's presence. You see what I'm talking about, right? Do I have to show it? Yeah, all right, good. <laughs> so the building stands out in the architectural history, and here we are looking at it, the architectural history of Egypt, because it launched the practice of attaching the founder's tomb to his endowed foundation. 
And in so doing, it established a new, more powerful relation between the patron and his major public work. The complex didn't simply bear his name, it now held his body and turned the madrasa as a whole into a grand commemorative institution. In turn, the invitation to pray inside the tomb and the sound of Quran recitation emanating from the adjacent madrasa gave the sultan an aura of religious piety. But remember, this guy's a politician and he's a warrior. There's nothing particularly pious about him. This is where a text could not call him a saint, but the architecture can let the kind of sound of sanctity wash over him and imply a kind of sanctity that he doesn't really have. This is where architecture and text speak very differently. The addition of the tomb changed the paradigm of what architecture in Cairo could do, and that it empowered the building to stand in for the founder himself. Architecture gained identity in the visible, real presence of the patron's body, lying under the lofty dome. It's actually lying below this. You know, it's always below ground. Uh, lying under that lofty dome that demanded attention in the part of the city that mattered most. It's in the heart of the Fatimids of that walled city. So to summarize this very key point, the madrasa enabled the patron to embellish the street and stake a claim to the city. And from that point on, patrons did this all the time. I'll just show you an example. This is, I just love this building, which is why I always use it as this example. But that dome is dome marking the cenotaph underneath it, and it's highly visible. This is just one of many, many Mamluk complexes that follows this same strategy of tomb attached to a religious or semi-religious complex. Indeed, the Mamluk Cairo of ornamental domes and minarets that we, do, that we so love today began in 1250 with Sultan Salih's complex. Each of these tombs contains the remains of a deceased person, and each dome is a visual semiotic sign of that presence. This was a profoundly important innovation that changed architecture's ability to preserve memory and communicate, to reveal and make visible individual identity in the public sphere. But we all already know that it was not Sultan Salih who added the tomb, but rather Shajr Dur. And this begs the question of her motivation. If the claims his identity, his lasting presence, what did it do for her? A tomb, I'm fascinated by tombs. I just, it's like all I ever want to talk about is tombs lately. A tomb is, and it's because a tomb is unlike other forms of architecture in that it commemorates its occupant, not its patron. If you think about it, most of the time we talk about so-and-so's mosque, but it's the person buried in the tomb who gets commemorated. So it's a very different strategy of identification. It therefore serves the descendants of the occupant by celebrating the blood lineage of the occupant, right? My, I come from my father, who may not be here anymore, but that's where I come from. The same lineage that gives them, of course, political legitimacy. Because tombs celebrate genealogy, sons built them for their fathers, and free women built them for their sons, and sometimes their fathers less often for their husbands. In other words, free women who built plenty of tombs built them so as to celebrate their own family line, which was part of their political capital after all. But how does a tomb serve a slave or former slave who has no family? Remember, Shajar Adur was orphaned through slavery and her only son had died in infancy. She has no family whatsoever. How does a tomb serve someone whose bloodline is not displayed in the act of patronage? Her claim to legitimacy, of course, was made not through her father, somewhere back on the Turkic steppe, but through her relationship to Sultan Salih as consort, then wife, mother of his son, and finally widow. Her power derived from the Sultan, whether he was alive or dead. And therefore, it was in her own political interest to embellish his major architectural work and celebrate him in a way that was as public as possible. That communication was made in space, also through time, because, of course, these tombs were built for eternity. And we can credit these innovations to Shah Jaradur. Now, the story could end here. With the death of Sultan Salih, and the end of the Ayyubids in Egypt, the unusual rule of Shah Jaradur as the first Mamluk Sultan, and the innovation that enabled architecture to express personal identity. However, her story does not end there. 
If her rise to power was dramatic, her fall was equally dramatic. When Shajaradur ceded the throne and entered into marriage with Ibak, she had insisted on a marriage contract that forced him to divorce, to divorce his first wife. This is not an uncommon contract for marriage in Islam, the insistence that there be only one wife. So he had to divorce his first wife because she was not going to take second place to anyone. Moreover, the contract stipulated that he could not enter into any additional marriages. And so, in 1257, when to consolidate his political power, he made the very sensible diplomatic move of courting the daughter of an important ruler of a nearby province. That's, after all, what royal marriages do, right? They are forms of diplomatic alliance. So he's doing the right thing in some ways, but Shajaradur became enraged by the breach of marriage contract and she arranged to have him murdered in the Cairo Citadel. The story becomes violent and complicated at this point, and I recount all of it in the book. But I'm just going to skip over it here and simply say that in retaliation, Shajradur was murdered a short time later. By the way, both of the murders, both of the murders happen in the baths because, of course, that's where you're unarmed. Uh, where are we? Fortunately, I guess fortunately, I mean... I, once you're dead, I guess it doesn't really matter. But anyway, the queen had, before her death, completed her husband's tomb seven years earlier, and then she had set about planning a tomb for herself. And while her tomb was smaller, and you're seeing it here, was smaller than her husband's, it was far more daring in its claims to personal identity. It was located outside the walled city, down at the bottom here, here, outside the walled city, away from the political center, but near the tombs and shrines of early Muslim saints, such as Saida Rukhaya, also Saida Nafisa, is, is, which is still a very active shrine, is just for a little further down here. So this is a kind of, um, I don't want to call it a sacred precinct exactly, but it is this area that has this aura and people come uh, to visit the tombs and to talk to the saints. Uh, so it's located there, and Doris Barron's Abu Saif has found a little bit of evidence, some visual evidence, to support the theory that the tomb was part of a larger ensemble that might have included a madrasa and possibly gardens. But since nothing remains of that fabric today, again, I think we have to call this a hypothesis um, that makes sense, but for which we don't actually have proof. However, the tomb in and of itself is remarkable. It is uh, well-preserved, and it contains a remarkably complete program of wall paintings, which I show you here. A team of architectural restorers, led by Mai al-Ibrashi, carefully cleaned the interior walls about five years ago, revealing the murals, which I show you here. And if there's a graduate student in the room who's looking for a wonderful dissertation topic, I can't think of anything better than Ayyubid painting, because it hasn't really been written about, and we have at least two buildings with very well-preserved murals with lots of fragmentary um, other pieces that one could talk about. And I don't know what these mean or where they come from. The tomb's mihrab is equally well-preserved. This is a photograph from before preservation. Yeah, before the preservation. Uh, it's equally well-preserved. It's hood filled with brilliant gold mosaic and mother of pearl discs. We all know, of course, that images of people and animals are avoided in Muslim religious settings, such as mosques and tombs. Shajaradur, nonetheless, managed to place an image, if we can call it that, of herself in the most highly charged place in any building where prayer occurs here in the mihrab. And that is because her name, Shajaradur, means tree of pearls. And what we're looking at here is a tree of pearls. It's her. Now, I also have to tell you something. Um, the poster shows this sideways. So it's also a tree of life, right? But when I looked at it, I suddenly realized it was sideways. But I have to, I come from a department of landscape architecture, and so sideways it's now a ground cover, and I have no problem with that. So I didn't write to have it corrected. I think it's fine either way. She probably would have had a conniption, but anyway. Uh, the use of mosaics was a novelty, and there it is sideways. <laughs> Ground cover. The use of mosaics was a novelty, since there were no other works of golden mosaic in Egypt in that period. So this is her being innovative again. But then the question is, where does the mosaic idea and technique come from? And my theory is that she had seen mosaics somewhere in Syria, 
She may well have gone to Damascus, for example, with Salih in the period before their triumphant arrival in Cairo. I know, we know that she traveled around with him. We don't know what she saw when she traveled, but since there were mosaics multiple places in Syria, it's hard to believe she never saw them. So while it's been suggested by other scholars that the mosaics in her tomb were added in the 1280s by Sultan Kalaun, and those are the ones from Kalaun on the right, I just don't think that argument holds. Again, I go into it in great detail in the book, but just by juxtaposing the two slides, I think I make the case. There is nothing aesthetically similar about these two. They could not have been done by the same artist. They're not even using the same tesseract. So this is clearly, and I actually think the Shajar Adur ones are vastly inferior. So I think this is an earlier state of mosaic building when it first arrives in Cairo. And, you know, they're, it's not that they're not good at it. It's that they're rather, um, it's sort of black or white. You know, gold, black, white. That's sort of your choices in hers versus the rich coloration in, the, um, in Sultan Kalaun. So I don't think that um, the Sultan Kalaun mosaics have anything at all to do with hers. So anyway, back to her. If the use of mosaics was innovative, the way she employed them to make an image of herself is simply astounding. The mosaics represent a tree of pearls, making clear reference to her name. And it is an amazing act of self-expression, of architecture communicating identity. Scott Redford has noticed the similarity of the design to a blazon, which I showed you earlier, a type of image that proliferated among the Mamluks, but that seems to have emerged in the late Ayyubid period. And of course, the purpose of the blazon is to represent, to identify. Despite the fact that Shajar Adur does appear in the historical chronicles and played an important role in Egyptian history, she remains an elusive character whose romantic biography was heavily embellished by later storytellers. And in this respect, she is like all the other historical persons whose subjectivity is re reduced to the texts, pictures, objects, and architecture that remains to represent them. She holds a uniquely important position in history as the first in the long line of Mamluk rulers, yet also in some respects, the last of the Ayyubids. She was not of the Ayyubid bloodline, Yet she was the mother of an infant prince whose brief existence made it possible for the sultan to consign power to her in the name of the deceased heir. So while she was not of the bloodline, she was essential for its con continuation. As a woman, she belonged to Sultan Salih as his slave and then his wife. But later, as sultan, she established a place for those Mamluk sultans who succeeded her, providing a kind of bridge through the female body and its procreative ability between two distinct dynasties and ultimately two different ways of governing, one based on heredity, father to son, the other based on merit, where any capable slave might rise to the throne. Yet despite being the first of the Mamluk rulers, she's typically dismissed by historians as an anomaly because her reign was so short. And here again, gender matters. Whereas a man's rule would typically end with his dethronement, or more likely his assassination, her influence and control did not end with her abdication, because like so many other women in history, Shajar Adur continued to exercise power at one remove from the throne. So we have her, her, um, her actual rule of 86 days here, but I... <laughs> She's, she's in charge, she's calling the shots for 17 years. She's also dismissed because as a woman, she had to act through male intermediaries. After all, she didn't actually build the tomb. She didn't go there with a trowel and put the stucco on the walls. The supposition is that acting through agents, she could not have had a significant personal investment in her commissions. This is an argument that precludes the possibility for intentionality among all the sultans and kings to whom we attribute innovation and great works of art, because each one relied on artists, architects, counselors, and staff. Therefore, to say that this sultan queen had no voice of her own would be to eviscerate the concept of patrons' exercise of taste at any point in history. And also, you know, that mihrab is such a clear reference to herself, right? That's not someone doing it generically. It's done for her. 
She was an innovator, attaching tombs to endowed in institutional complexes, clamoring for attention with tall domes and projecting facades, reviving the technique of mosaic, and inserting a reference to herself in the tomb's prayer niche. So what I do in the book is to turn the gender question around. Instead of seeing gender as a deficit that has to be defended, adding women into histories from which they have been excluded, I propose that the paradigm shift in architecture that she affected through her patronage of these two remarkable tombs, this innovative use of architecture to represent human identity, occurred precisely because of the challenge that her gender imposed. Unable to appear in public, women could not after all, she used the architecture of the mausoleum metonymically to stand in for first her absent husband and then herself. They're both absent in some respects. And she pushed this even beyond architecture into the realm of pictorial representation. And the impact of this was lasting, as we see from the monument, as we saw, from the monumental tombs of all the later Mamluk sultans that are now visible in the city of Cairo, because they all start to um, represent and identify in that way. The self-aggrandizing claim to architectural presence, to individuality, to visibility, all those things that collectively comprised the norm that excluded women, was made possible because of a woman a slave who became the first Mamluk to rule Egypt. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.